First up, it's Harlan and Wolf. Our first speaker tonight is CEO at Harlan and Wolf, who specialise in ship repairs and shipbuilding, as well as the renewable energy sector. Harlan operate across four sites in the UK at Belfast, Appledore, Methyl, and Arnish. Harlan and Wolf delivered its first new build vessel in 20 years last week as it launched the first barge for Cody Group with 22 more to follow, part of an £18 million contract. This is a major stepping stone to the massive £1.6 billion defence contract for three fleet solid support vessels, which Harland won recently, as part of a consortia with Navante UK and Naval Architects BMT. Let's hear from John Wood, uh, the CEO. Welcome, John. Good evening, Donald, and uh, good to be with you again. It's always a pleasure to have you, John. Now, I believe you've got a, a video that you would like to, to play for us uh, initially. We do, Donald. We've got a brand new video, so we thought we'd uh, share it with you first and uh, all your listeners to get a um, first uh, view of this new video we've got. So we can uh, go through that and I'll uh, take you through a pack. OK, over to you, Mike. Let's play the video. Thanks for sharing that with us, John. Now, uh, back, to your, back to your slide presentation. Perfect. Thanks for that, Donald. So, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for uh, dialing in um, and viewing this evening's presentation. Um, I'll take you through a few slides, just give you a bit of an update about our business, what we're up to. Clearly, we're at a really exciting um, time of the business. We're three years into a, a five-year plan, um, and we've, we've had some several um, big wins over recent weeks. Uh, with the fleet solid support contract, as Donald mentioned, and we're very close to uh, some other projects um, coming through as well. And that's in addition, of course, to the, the barges and the fleet solid support um, vessel that's, that's going into Belfast in the uh, M55 project that's down in Appledore. Um, when you look at the board, you've obviously got myself um, as a CEO with Arun Rahman um, as a CFO, 
Um, Malcolm Groat is our chairman, who's got many years um, acting as chair in NEDs within um, on the market. So Jonathan Band, who's the ex first Sea Lord and also a main board director for Carnival um, Corp, which is uh, one of the major industries um, that we are in. And then we've got Kat, Katia um, Zavota, who's um, in renewable energy and has held several high positions with, with Shell in that domain um, and is very experienced in funding um, and growing businesses as we move forward. So then in case you look at the structure of the business we've got today, um, we've got high, Island McGee Energy on one side um, with Island McGee Energy Hub. The difference there is we've got the main project, which is seven um, gas caverns uh, and Island McGee that I'll talk about in a little bit more depth as we move through. And then I've got Island McGee Energy Hub, which is an incubator um, for some additional new projects um, in that energy space around to renewables. When you move across to Harland and Wolf, um, we've got our four sites, Belfast and Northern Ireland, Appledore, Methyl um, and Arnish in the Outer Hebrides. So the, the focus of the presentation this evening is really looking at our journey so far, our future vision, um, and then talking a little bit about Team Resolute and the Fleet Solid Support, support Contract. And then we'll just touch on um, Island McGee Energy. So if you look at the journey we've been on um, since 2010, um, the Island McGee um, energy concept was developed through Infrastrata um, at the time. We've moved on through uh, when we joined the business, myself and Arun, we completed the feed and did a lot of detailed study work on how to get the project moving. Um, and look, it was clear at that time um, that it may take a bit longer than we initially expected to get the, the project over the line. So we decided we needed some more business uh, to keep the company viable and vibrant as we move through. Um, some excellent acquisition opportunities presented themselves um, in the Belfast acquisition of 5.25 million. Then we acquired the Appledore shipyard down in Devon um, for 7 million. And then the two um, yards up in Scotland. So I think we've now got six, 60 um, odd percent of the fabrication capacity in the UK as we move forward in the marine and fabrication space. When you look at our sites across the UK, as you can see on this chart, from Methyl um, on the east coast of Scotland, um, you go through the renewable wind farms, for example, up that east coast around uh, the, the Pentland Firth, down through the, the Outer Hebrides inside and out, Outer Hebrides, um, down through the, the Irish Sea and the Celtic Sea, past Appledore, past Belfast and Appledore, we're in the exact right location for all the new development that, developments that are coming to bear. And I think we've got two of the, the largest dry docks in the UK and the largest, um, sm the smaller, largest undercover dry dock down in Appledore, which is great for new building projects um, of, of that smaller variety. I think when you look at the, the footprint that we've got, 256 acres, of prime real estate right down on the waterfront. And we've got strong relationships with the key decision makers um, and political decision makers. And I think we're now one of three shipyards with a third shipyard stream that's been brought online um, for building new MOD vessels. And I think when you look at the offshore wind market, it is that continues to develop. Um, you'll see a lot of local content in Scotland, for example, I think BP announced recently that they were committed to building SOVs in Scotland. And I think you look at the fabrication of larger structures. And I think we've got the broad geographical spread. And having four sites, you can spread your risk over the different side sites. Um, really pick up on the availability of labour across the UK so that you've not got all your eggs um, in one basket. So if you look at you know, some of the things that are really key to, to how we are doing this, it's really new technology and embracing innovation and technology. Um, and look, in the future, we're looking to deepen that building dock to 14 metres to get the next generation of cruise ships in there. Um, and that's really in collaboration with, with cruise owners who really struggle to find uh, dry docks with that depth across the UK. And it's having you know, a lot of collaboration um, through that. And I think as we go through looking towards net zero, alternative fuels, battery operations, green technology and the likes, 
Um, and look, I think we, we're delivering what clients are looking for in the, this day and age. And if you look at the investment case, this is a, a fairly simple chart um, we've put together looking at the turnover um, of, of the business in the forecast that we've issued to the market um, at the moment. So we, we've gone back from the, the pre-revenue position in 2019. We've gone up through, um, you know, getting up to 1.4, 2.9, um, 28 million and then the expected revenue um, this year of 100 to 150 million that we're on target to reach. And I think that the hardest area in that journey really was between 2021 and 2022. I think now that we've got the, the, the staff and people and we've got the, the management teams in place, it's a lot easier to see that growth. And I think falling on to the, the final year of our forecast at the moment, it's up to that 200 to 230 million um, revenue. And I think onwards from there, we're looking to get year-on-year -year revenues of at least 500 million. And I think that that's backed up by the, the, the spread, the slide that I'll take you through in a moment, showing the level of opportunities um, that we have in the market. Um, that's from the pipeline of weighted opportunities and unweighted opportunities. And I think we're now really competitively positioned with the facility we've got. Um, shipbuilding's clearly now a government priority with the establishment of the new National Shipbuilding Office. It's doing really great work um, to really position shipbuilding as an industry um, that people want to work in um, and that government can support as we move forward. And we've got that ability to grow at scale. And I think it's not just about what we can do in the shipyards. It's about our in-service support line, how we get that work going outside the shipyard. Um, and I think, you know, you look at Island McGee Energy, we've got one of the most sought after projects um, probably in the world at the moment, given uh, the transition to, to net zero and how things will go to hydrogen. And I'll, I'll talk more about that um, in a little bit. Um, and look, the, the firm foundations are in place. We, we've done a lot of the hard work over the, the past few years, um, getting the business stabilised. Uh, we've got a wider experience board in place and, you know, we've got 77 million now that's getting invested into the yards in Belfast and, and Appledore as we move forward, really to make us one of the most advanced shipyards in the UK. Um, no other shipyard in the UK has spent that amount of money purely on technology to give themselves that edge. And I think, you know, we've got a great diverse project portfolio as we go through. Um, now got a backlog of 900 million over seven years with a weighted pipeline um, of opportunities in excess of three billion um, as we move through. And I think, you know, that 500 million of, of uh, annualised turnover by 2025 it is really a great place to be in. And we've got the, the 200 million syndicated debt facilities with Astra Management um, and commercial banks that we looked to have in place um, by the end of June um, this year. And again, that really puts us on a firm foundation um, for the next stage of our journey. I think if you look at this chart, I won't uh, stay on it too long because uh, I know Donald uh, will, will be on me for running over for time. Um, you know, we've got, a, at the moment, we've got a, a large defence um, contingent in our workload, 16% um, commercial then we've got the cruise and ferry market um, that really seems to be under a bit of a renaissance as we go through in relation to um, repairs and maintenance, given on the back of COVID, the new build um, facility has really slowed down considerably to from where it was before. Um, I think, as you can see, the, the weighted and non-weighted pipeline, given our win rate at 34 percent, we've got more than enough um, opportunities in that weighted and unweighted bucket to get to our um, expected revenues uh, for 2023, 2024, and obviously um, into 2025. As you get past 2025, you're starting to see rep rev revenues, the weighted and unweighted pipeline tail off a little bit. That's just because we don't have site projects and programs with enough detail at this moment in time. But by the time we get to 2028 in the middle chart on the backlog, we're looking about a multi-year backlog of about two, two billion. And that's with uh, you know converting some of the backlog to revenue as we go forward. And I think the, the top um, chart there on revenue, it's an interesting mix as you see the change from being overly reliant um, on defense to where renewables is starting to kick in and really um, boost the business as we go forward. You then look, just for those of you that don't know the business, we, we've got five key markets, 
defence, commercial, energy, um, cruise and ferry and renewables. And we operate all through the, the project life cycle from technical services and engineering design at the beginning of the project life cycle, fabrication, construction, new build vessels, repairs, structures, um, and that type of thing, onto repairs and maintenance, in-service support. It's an area that we're looking to really grow over the coming weeks and months. Conversion, again, it's an area that we see is high potential for growth and then decommissioning um, at the end of the project life cycle. Um, we've started to really boost our own design capacity. Um, the bottom left is a, a work boat that we've designed in-house. Um, the picture up above it is an in-house design for a, a fishing vessel. And then obviously the magnificent flagship that never was, um, that we designed um, under the, the, the last prime minister, but one. Um, and I think look, that was a great program. It really brought out the potential that we have for future design. Um, and I think we do have interested parties in, in that design at the moment. So if you look at the, the markets um, quickly, um, current project in defence, um, M55 upgrade, uh, potential interest in a donorship to return it to a mine hunter. And then you'll see the picture on the left here is the, the last time we built major sections for a submarine. And with the uh, Australian, US, UK submarine programme, that's something that we see there's real potential in, um, given that we're one of the few shipyards in the UK that's actually built parts for a submarine in the past. And I think, you know, in defence market, it's all about getting the right partner, the right experience for the job with the right risk level. Um, you look at the commercial market again, um, a Greenland mining project that we've just finished, replacement dock gates, barges, pontoons, um, fishing, agriculture, um, energy is really LNG carriers, FPSOs, manifolds, nuclear structures, and the like. Um, and look, cruise and ferry, again, one of our key markets. We've docked over 150 vessels since we commenced operations. 25 live cruise inquiries at this moment in time with electrification, Scottish shipbuilding programme focusing on CalMac um, from Methyl and Arnish. That, that's some of the areas, and I think there's obviously the Isles of Scilly, um, down for Appledore, and I think you know some of these larger cruise ships uh, when they're in refit has got more than three thousand people on board during a refit. Um, when you look at the renewable markets, you've got jackets, you've you've got floating wind, and again, huge market, billions and billions of pounds. Um, and look, we've got a key place to play in that as they start taking C CDF over the next few um, months. We'll start to see some of that work being released along with the CTV, um, SOV market. Um, Team Resolute, we've spoken about this in quite a lot of detail um, in recent times, joint venture um, relationship between um, Harland & Wolf, BMT and Navantia, the Spanish shipbuilder who's delivered multiple ships on time, on budget, and we're really doing a lot of technology transfer from Navantia to make us into one of the UK's leading shipbuilders. And I think by having Navantia involved, it really reduces our risk profile. Um, when you look at the, the gas storage project in Island McGee, um, obviously everybody will be aware we've got a judi judicial review next week in Belfast um, that we hope to prevail at. We don't see any reason, and even as uh, early as today, uh, I've gone through the, the recent round of document and court papers that's going in. We still believe we're in a, a great position um, to get the judicial review over and done with and really get that project stemmed up, stand, stood up um, so we can actually get on with the construction of it. I think there's huge future potential um, for getting that project into hydrogen in later years, subject to regulatory approval. And I think why it's so important, really, is the need for energy. And I think with the Ukraine and Russian situation, um, you know, gas storage is more important than ever. As you can see from the chart on the left, um, the amount of gas storage in the UK it is particularly poor um, and puts us towards the bottom of the ranking list for storage. And I think Northern Ireland also becomes more challenging given the 100% reliance on um, imported gas from, from the mainland. So I think the project gives us 19 days um, supply of gas um, for the whole of the UK and 60 days um, for Northern Ireland in the storage hold, around 500 million cubic metres um, of gas. 
So, you know, the, we've got lots of opportunities around the project from a, a complete sale of the project um, to a farm down, traditional oil and gas farm down arrangement, which will leave us with a, you know, 25, 30% of the programme to acquire a loan through the National Infrastructure Bank to actually develop the project, given it's a strategic national asset um, for the UK. So I think, look, we're not getting too carried away. We'll get through the judicial review. Then we'll look at how best to proceed um, with the programme after that time. But I think we've done a lot of work recently in relation to hydrogen, what hydrogen means. Um, and I think when you look at the large development of wind farms around the coast of Ireland, certainly one scheme that becomes very appealing is the um, excess energy from wind getting converted to hydrogen and stored in caverns. But as I say, that's a, a development further, further down the line. So I think look, just to summarise where we are, continue to build and convert the pipeline to increase sales, execute the 200 million refinancing. We don't have any plans um, for a capital raising um, and dilution at this time. Deliver the CapEx upgrades, the 77 million that we've got ongoing in Belfast. Continue to grow the team and bring more expertise into the business and deliver the prefabrication work for fleet solid support. If we get all that right, we'll deliver our target revenues. We'll get a margin that we're looking for between 24 and 27 percent. Establish a balanced capital stack and achieve uh, annualised cash flow break-even um, in financial year 24. And I think, look, it's all about uh, delivering returns for our shareholders. So I think that's where we, uh, we're clearly focused, and it's all about delivering um, and converting pro projects. Um, so look, to summary, market positions firmly established, um, contracts won, numerous contracts through SIPEM, M55, Curry, um, Cruise and Ferry, um, backlog of contracts, 900 million over seven years, weighted pipeline of 3.6 billion, 2020, sorry, 200 million of refinance and expected to close 2023. And look, we're in a great position to capitalize as we move forward. So that concludes the uh, presentation, uh, Donald. Okay, that was fantastic, uh, John. That was really good. That was a great summary of the business. Um, let me let me kick off by asking the importance of of this FSS and all the, the, the what seems to be relatively small amounts of money, a small amounts of revenue. You've got twenty five million this year, twenty five million next year. Then you've got the seventy seven million recapitalisation plan. But in reality, what it appears to me is you're actually laying the foundations for future success. So tell me what's happening in the short term and how that will build into something a a, a quite. A, a, quite powerful for you in the future years? Well, I think when you look at where we are at the moment, Donald, I think we've come from reactivating the yards and, you know, you can't just start work on a, a 1.6 billion contract overnight. So these foundation projects that we're working on now, it's really all about building the skills, building the knowledge of how to operate the, the high-tech equipment that we've got, the robotic welders and things like that. So it's really building that up. And I think with M55 down in Appledore, We've been doing some, some subcontract work for BE Systems um, down there as well, fabricating structures for them. So it's all about building that skills in base up. And I think we're, we're up to just short of 800 employees um, now across the group. So it's building those numbers up. It's building the credibility up. And I think being able to deliver the programs that we've got on time, on budget and make money, it's just beginning to grow and grow and grow. And I think the, the level of work um, that's out in the market at the moment and the stuff we're tending, we're starting to see now a real drumbeat of projects coming through. I think one of the unfortunate things is with some of the NDAs that are in place, it's really difficult to actually share uh, information on every single project that we are we are winning, but we continue to, to win projects on a week-by-week, -week, month by month basis. And I think that the Belfast shipyard um, certainly over the last few weeks has been uh, jam-packed. So I think it was over the, over the last seven years, you said you're expecting, or over the next seven years, you're expecting 700 to 800 million of revenues to flow through the business from the FSS subcontract. So how does that all position uh, Harland and Wolf for the future? Well, I think you have to look at the next couple of years this year um, and in the, to the end of next year is really about the infrastructure and the infrastructure upgrade. Um, we had a first quarterly review meeting with the client um, last week that everything went very well, client's happy, 
um, the, a direct client, which is Navantia UK and the Ministry of Defence. Uh, everybody was happy with the progress that we've made. And I think you already see demolition work um, happening in Belfast. So we're moving um, things around in Belfast to make room for the extension to the construction hall and the panel line. So it's really this next two years is engineering design, um, actually acquisition um, of materials, equipment, supplies for that project to get moving. Um, and then as you move from that stage into test pieces, we get the test pieces done, then we move into eventual production um, in January 2025. So look, it's a really exciting period for us. And, you know, we're already working hard to try and get ahead of schedule to build some more flow into the programme as we move forward, you know. Now, you mentioned uh, the impact of inflation on the FSS bill, John. Um, I, there's a hundred million, uh, 100 million number uh, floating around. Does that number come from you? Is that the number that, that you think inflation will add to the project? I think the, the 100 million number that's floating around in the, in the market, Donald, is a, a number that uh, one of our competitors announced to the market um, earlier on, but late last week, that they, uh, that they've not included inflation um, in their contract. Um, I think one of the things we did um, was we included inflation um, as an addition to the contract from day one. Um, you know, so we, we are clearly protected from that. Um, so, you know, in, inflation is uh, accounted for over and above um, our base costs. That sounds very wise, John. So for you, inflation is less of an issue because it, it, it's wrapped up in the, in the terms of the contract. Absolutely. So I think it's something that, you know, we, we, we look at and, you know, we've not built any money in for inflation. Clearly, we, we get inflation um, as it actually happens. And I think, look, for us and the size of the business, that, that's one of the risk, risk mitigation measures um, we put in place early doors so we didn't really get caught out because I think, look, anybody's guess is where, uh, where inflation may go, you know. No, I appreciate that there that, that are NDAs and so on in, in, in place, but if you could do your best to summarise the latest contract wins, and even if you could summarise those wins which are within touching distance, but you can't quite get there and can't quite tell us about them, tell us as much as you can about them at the moment. Well, I think if you look through the markets, um, starting in the renewable market, you know, we, we've got 40, 44, 45 different programs. There's some test programs and test pieces that we're hoping to secure um, this year and in, in the first half. Um, then mo that moves on to, to the larger programs. You know, we've got um, some new build vessels for, for Appledore that we're very close to, um, both from a, a commercial and a cruising a cruise ferry market. Um, and I think if you move into the, the, the cruise and ferry, cruise market really more than the ferry, uh, we've got multiple cruise ships that we've got variable bookings for. We really just need to tie them up and get them into a, a contracted position. So which which so of the different markets do you see is the hottest at the moment, John? Look, I think you've got a mixture. I think you've got um, cruise and ferry that is very hot. I think you've got renewables that will be coming, becoming very hot um, as you get into the end of next year. Um, but I think, look, this commercial market, given the number of vessels uh, that weren't dry docked during uh, COVID, you really start to see all the extensions of time running out. So we expect to see a, a big surge that would, you know, the level inquiries would, would back that up. Um, so I think, look, those markets are fairly buoyant. But again, oil and gas, I think the pennies eventually dropped that there won't be uh, an instant transition to renewables. So we're starting to see a lot more activity um, on the offshore oil and gas space. So I think, look, Donald, we're, we're, we're fairly good across all markets. Um, and I think we just need to really keep pushing and just keep delivering programmes, you know. OK, interesting answer there from you, John. Um, what about sea rose? What about the Isle of Scilly re replacements? Now, I've been reading the London South East Bulletin Board, so I do actually know what the Isle of Scilly replacement <laughs> is. <laughs> you know what, Donald, you're always good at coming with some specific questions. Um, That's look, me. Isles of, <laughs> Isles of Scilly, we've been talking to um, the guys at Isle of Scilly now for, since we first acquired Belfast. So that's not a new uh, a new programme to us. We've been looking at it in great detail. Um, you know, we expect final bids to go in for that um, in the next few weeks. And look, that, that's an ideal ve ideal project for the vessel to be built. We built the last vessel, the Salonian, um, in 
Appledore, and you know it's still going after many years. So hey, look, we'd like to try and um, acquire that and get that program in. Ciro's um, again, it's a program that's been in Belfast before. Massive program, massive scope of works. We've done it before. We've proven we can do it before. So look, hopefully we, we can get that over the line. And I think, you know, there's a, a, a large volume of CalMAC ferry work um, out there. I think, you know, the facilities we've got and the track record that we're building, um, we stand a great chance on that also, you know. Indeed. And they've got you've got a Scottish uh, CEO as well. That's going to help. Well, we can all but try. <laughs> now, funding. Um you mentioned in your in your uh, presentation uh, that you've got 200 million of syndicated debt facility uh, uh, potentially at the end of June. So let's put some meat on the on the bones of that for us, please. Um, look, I think th- there's only so much I can say on that one, uh, Donald. I think we, we've been fairly clear um, on on the need for the, the the funding. It's really to to make sure our growth um, continues at the rate of progress that we want were adequately capitalised so that, you know, you know what aims like every two minutes, if you're not announcing something, everybody expects a fundraise. So I think, look, we're just trying to put this whole concept of funding to bed once and for all. The facility is split. We don't have to draw it down all in one go. We'll draw down what we need as we need it. We'll, it, we'll clear the business of all other debt that we've got in the business um, and we'll really focus in on having the, the, the one uh, debt package from a UK company, which it will be at a substantially lower rate than the existing debt that we've got in the business. And I think that, that comes because of the, the, the credibility that we're now establishing, the, the risk level for anybody incoming into that debt space is a lot easier. And it, it helps um, you know, with the UK EF um, guarantee that hopefully we get attached to that funding. So it's probably taken a bit longer um, than we wanted it to take. We were hoping to have it done um, but look, it's all about getting the right rate um, so that we can uh, right size that for the business rather than, you know, paying, paying too much for debt in the uh, in the short term. You know. And do you see that as a major de- de-risking moment? We, we do, actually, because I think, you know, it's one thing when you look at the share price. I mean, we announced a, a £1.6 billion contract and the share price went down. Um, you know, I think it's one thing that everybody looks at is to say, OK, so, yeah, you've got the work. But how do you have the working capital to deliver it? Look, I think that's really, it is the moment that, that de-risks it by saying, okay, we get the working capital, the working capital's in there. And even though the, the programme itself um, is milestone payments, progress payments, um, look, this just takes away uh, for the avoidance of doubt, you know. Okay, let's rattle through some questions from our uh, the London South East website next. Uh, Kevin Halpenny, he's a retail, retail shareholder and he asks... How difficult is it going to be for the company to manage health and safety, recruitment and retention of a new workforce, manage industrial relations, by which he means the unions, I think, uh, considering that you're going to be op- operating across five different locations? How do you avoid the pitfalls that could so easily derail progress? Well, I think that happens by the structure that we've put in place. We've got a matrix organisation with our functional leads, um, and then each site is classed as its own delivery centre with its own general manager. So I think it's all about the structure you set up, the support that's provided into, into those individual sites. And I think the work we've done over the last three years in building up the, the teams, getting the experience in, I think, you know, we've got team members, a, a new programme director for FSS, for example, has come in from Canada um, on the Coast Guard programme out there. So I think it's about bringing the right level experience in that can deliver for us. So I think, you know, it's all about the, the process and the time and ramping up steadily. And I think so far with the number of vessels that we've had through the yard, the number of structures that we've now fabricated, it is proven that the, the, the strategy that we've put in place works. But eventually we will end up bringing in um, a COO into the business um, as we continue to expand because that's the only way to really manage, manage the business effectively, you know. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the Isle McGee gas storage scheme judicial review, which starts on the 4th of May. Uh, it sparked some interest from uh, shareholders. Clearly it might. And Trevor D- Draper asks, should the Isle McGee ruling go in the company's favour, what are the company's preferred financing options? Which is not a bad question. 
Hey, it's not. Um, and look, I think we've got three different options, as I mentioned earlier. We either go down the direct sale uh, of the programme, we go down a route of um, farm down, or we go down the route of a, a loan from the National Infrastructure Bank, um, given the strategic nature of the business. And look, I think it's one of the things where we, we've sought a bit of feedback from um, retail investors at the recent um, evening we had in London, and we've sought it from institutional investors, really to get a flavour of, you know, would people like us to reduce the debt level in the company um, and not take the project on, or do we actually push ahead with the, with the programme, given the healthy return that would come out of it? And, you know, we, we only know that hydrogen in the future will become a more volatile market than natural gas. So we, we think there's a huge um, amount of potential. And at the moment, we're actually modelling uh, what the revenue um, flows in that project would look like. So I think it's a bit early to nail it. Um, I'm just more focused on next week, get next week out of the way and then see where we go from there. And I think look, that there's obviously op- options um, on Island McGee, depending on what the out- outcome of next week is. Certainly, regardless which way the judicial review goes, um, we still have options in both cases, you know. OK, long term holder Lee Harrison asks, uh, could the company produce an updated valuation for the gas storage facility, please? And with that in mind, how much would a wholly owned project add to the market cap of the company? Well, I think the market cap to the company is a, a really uh, interesting one. And I think it's not something I'm willing to speculate on because I think every time I think we've got a programme that's going to change the market cap, then it, it, it doesn't happen. So uh, I'll make the decision to remain silent and see if it has more of a positive influence, you know. I think, look, in relation to the, the value of um, Island McGee, um, I think it's an interesting one. I think the, the one thing with the delay that we've had, it's really increased the value um, of Island McGee. We've had no formal valuation. We've had um, various people sniffing around, indicating some numbers, um, and I think when you look in the millions, um, it's certainly high double digit millions um, at the moment. Um, maybe once the outcome of the judicial review comes, we might push up into the three digits. But look, early days, let, let's see where we get to. And I think it's a really hard asset to value. And I think until you win the judicial review, you put the program um, in place to, to build the project, you run the numbers again. Um, then, you know, the valuation will become a lot clearer, you know. Certainly uh, substantially higher by multiple times of what the company's invested in it to date, you know. Do you have any sense of when to expect the the, the announcement from the judicial review, the outcome? I've never been one to speculate on the judicial system, Donald. Um, it's like, been very slow to this point. <laughs> you know, every time you think it might be quick, it, it always lets me down. But look, in most judicial reviews, um, you're really talking eight to 12 weeks, I think. OK. Uh, what are you doing to attract institutional investors to buy in the open market, says no. David Wynne and Lee Harrison? Um, and what role does Liberum Capital play as broker? Well, I think one of the things we're looking to do is we grow and we're getting bigger. We're really looking to say, OK, how are we engaging um, with shareholders when we look to balance the equity stack in the future? When is the right time to do that? You know, is it two years down the line? Is it three years down the line? When is the right time? And it's to, to really get some guidance on what the best way to go about that. So that's Libram's position. It really just gives us a different view um, to the view of our main broker, Senkos. It just sort of gives us a bit of a cross-reference. Um, and when you look at the first part of the question, again, I'm trying to think what it was again, Donald. To you, the well, that's it, really. How do, you, how do you attract institutional, institutional investors yeah. and what role does Liberum Capital play? And I think the institutional piece um, is it, interesting. It aim, in my view, is in turmoil at the moment. Aims becoming a market um, that you know a lot of people are taking their, their funds out of. You've had a lot of redemptions in, in funds. You know the share price does drop off, drop off a bit. You then hit the triggers and you go outside um, areas where people are comfortable in investing, just purely based on market cap. So I think look, we've had a little bit of a rough ride uh, on the back of um, winning FSS. Um, something that should have really boosted the, the market cap has gone the other way. 
But I think it's all about continuing to deliver, Donald, and, and win more what deliver deliver on the on the uh, revenue targets that we've made um, and set for this year. I think we do that between now and the, the next 18 months when we get to a break-even point, you really start to see um, institutions coming back on board. And I think, you know, it, it, there's more than one institution apologised that, that, that they had to leave um, given where they were in their own internal position. So, look, I don't doubt we'll have institutions, um, some that have left back on board again. It's just all about timing and the market conditions, you know. Would you see yourself as more comfortable in the main market, perhaps? Well, it's something I think we spoke about maybe two years ago where we were looking at the main market, and I think it's certainly something that I'm still fairly attracted to um, because I just think it's a lot more stable. And I think when you look at our competitors um, as we come out of fleet solid support, um, you know, both being on the main market, it probably makes a lot of sense to uh, look at that. And I think, you know, that's one of the other briefs that, Libram have got is to uh, give us some advice around that, you know. Okay, question. quick question from Michael Vidal. You've previously mentioned uh, possible contracts in relation to demonstration units for floating wind. Floating wind has got to be a big area for you guys. Uh, Absolutely. Wh when are we likely to hear more on this? Well, look, you know, again, we can only be guided by when the operators um, get themselves to the table and start awarding things. Look, there's three or four projects that are Imminent, I think I've been saying they've been imminent probably for the last two, three months. Um, but look, there's some really nice, tidy little projects that will be a great way of us demonstrating our credibility and our capability um, coming up soon. So look, we're certainly hoping in the next few months to uh, have at least one or two of those over the line. You know. Great. Uh, final question altogether from Lee Harrison this time again. How much, and we can answer this briefly, how much of the £4 million uh, performance bond was, was received back from SIPEM? 100%. Fantastic. Thank you, John. That was absolutely terrific.